Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Hillel Baude. Hillel Baude studied medicine at the University of Cape Town Medical School and obtained a PhD in physiology, in, in philosophy, sorry, cum laude, with the University of Chicago, studying the invisible thread, intuition in medical and moral reasoning. Dr. Baude also completed postdoctoral fellowship in neuroethics and also in religion and bioethics at McGill University. He is author in the book of Intuition in Medicine, a Philosophical Defense of Clinical Reasoning, which came out in the University of Chicago Press 2012. He is currently Director of Research at the FNES Center in the North of Israel for Treatment of Infants with Autism and their whole families. And they are going to sp speak to us about how can neuroscience improve medical expertise. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Amit, for the uh, introduction and the invitation to uh, to present today. Um, so uh, the invitation is quite last minute. So, uh, but it's, so I've presented a slideshow. I hope it's uh, it coheres. Um, but it's a very nice opportunity to to present some ideas that I've published on and to present to uh, a neuroscience audience. Uh, main disclaimer, I'm not a neuroscientist. This talk is uh, some combination of uh, philosophy, philosophical thinking with uh, some neuroscience approach. But uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I, I w part of the aim of the talk is to encourage collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration between the humanities and neurosciences. So, if there are any mistakes in, the <laughs> in my neuroscience, uh, please feel free to correct it. Um, I, in fact, I would welcome that, so it's not a, it's not a problem. But, uh, but really to see how to start getting a dialogue going uh, between neuroscience and, and humanities, particularly philosophy. I was just telling Amit that uh, a couple of years ago I was invited to, to write a perspective, an Israeli perspective on the, on the topic of cognitive, neuro, uh, cognitive enhancement and um, from what I saw there's very very little serious ethical reflection within the neuroscience community about the ethical practical effects of these incredible um, technologies and the possibilities of changing the brain, enhancing creating a new a new humanity and a kind of plea would be to for the academic institutions to put a, a small percentage of funds aside for, for serious reflection not just on on the how of the science but also on the why and and I believe it would also uh, in, influence the, the development of the neuroscience itself that it's quite a big conversation so neurohumanities. Um, there's many, many disciplines evolving today with uh, putting the N together with the uh, H, the neurosciences with the humanities. For example, neuroethics, neurophilosophy, neuropsychoanalysis, neurophenomenology, critical neuroscience. I'm sure every day there's a kind of a new, a new discipline emerging. But what's, what's common with all of these is the attempt to integrate what is essentially a reductionistic scientific approach, which is correct as far as it goes, with a kind of more overarching uh, discipline in terms of thinking about, in terms of the humanities. And, and who knows if that's actually something that is really achievable to put what are essentially two quite different research paradigms um, together. So my talk today is coming out of the field of, of neuroethics, which in its classical formulation already since 2002, there was a, a, a conference in, in California that's um, subsidized by the Dana Foundation, which put neuroethics forward as a, as a professional field. And it's basically self-defined as a, a combination of bioethics and neuroscience discipline concerned with the ethical, legal, and social implications of research and clinical applications relating to the brain. And the argument at the time was saying neuro neuroethics should be different from other subsections, subsections of bioethics 
because it's dealing with, with the brain, the seat of, of human consciousness, and therefore it, it really should merit being a, an independent field in itself. And just to go back to this previous slide, the, the tension or the creative tension is, be, is between understanding the, the brain in terms of a neurobiological machine and understanding uh, human consciousness and mental function. And all the neurohumanities in their way are trying to address uh, the marriage of, of consciousness and, and brain science. Um, one subsection of, of neuroethics is called the ethics of neuroscience, and this is really the field which I'm most concerned with, which is trying to say what the science of the mind can tell us about moral reasoning. So you have famous uh, studies, I think by Joshua Green on the moral trolley, the, mor the, the trolley problem, moral trolley problem of someone who's a, a, a trolley, a train trolley is going down the tracks and it can either smash into one person or five people and you're standing on the railway line and you're able to divert to save the five people but it will end up killing the one person. What do you do? And they does brain studies or the brain studies of people doing these kinds of problems. But classically the kinds of issues in the ethics of neuroscience, neuroscience include the problem of free will, nature of self-knowledge, moral reasoning. And I want to argue the talk today looking at, at clinical reasoning or clinical judgment fits into, into this ethics of, of neuroscience. Um, so I was sitting outside and I had a bit of time to spare and I was looking at the, the digital screen and looking at all the wonderful science and I was thinking, all right, what am I going to, how am I going to introduce this talk and things like that. And I, I saw a few things. One is that... Um, there's a lot of medicine on the, on the ELSIC board outside, how brain science can, will improve uh, the treatment of human disease, Huntington's disease, for example. Um, the other thing I saw was that, uh, you know, the importance of the primitive brain in terms of, in terms of neuroscience of decision-making. And that's something that I'm going to be talking a little bit about today in, in, in my talk. So I felt uh, <laughs> there was some kind of uh, relevance in terms of uh, presenting here today. Um, okay, that one I've done. So my talk today is entitled How Can Neuroscience Improve Medical Expertise? So the how is in brackets. So can it and how can it do it? Um, so the first thing to think about is what, it, what is medical expertise? So Jeffrey Norman, who's written uh, a lot about the notion of medical expertise or the acquisition of, of medical skills, says that expertise in medicine requires mastery of a diversity of knowledge and skills, motor, cognitive, and interpersonal. And there's three elements of, of medical action and decision making. The first is diagno patient diagnosis, the second is evaluation of possible therapies, and the third is deciding the best possible course of action in the particular circumstances. Now it's possible to apply neuroscience research to all three levels of, of first of all, medical expertise in terms of cognition and in terms of action and in terms of intersubjective relations and also in terms of the different levels of of uh, medical interaction in terms of diagnosis and evaluation of therapies. So at a simplistic le level, the first um, process which I, I put into the umbrella of clinical reasoning, you can use the, the tools of cognitive and effective neuroscience to look at the neuroscience of, of decision making. Um, in terms of the looking at therapeutic action, you could look at the neuroscience of action and intentionality. And thirdly, in terms of looking at the intersubjectivity of, of clinical interaction, you could look at the neuroscience of empathy. So I originally had the grand ambition today of presenting all three of these aspects, and then I quickly realized that would be quite an impossible task, particularly in the, in the time allotted. So I decided to focus uh, the talk today on, on the issue of uh, clinical reasoning or clinical judgment, or in terms of um, the issues of cognition. So 
Cognition broadly defined can refer to all mental processes related to knowledge, including memory, attention, perception, representational schemas, consciousness, language, and I'm sure there's a, you could add a, a few more to, to this list, um, which would be interesting to, to explore. Um, turning to clinical judgment, so it's kind of interesting to try and define what clinical judgment is. So I wrote a, an article recently on the notion of, of skill and clinical judgment, and I did some research trying to find a definition of, of clinical judgment or clinical reasoning. And it's actually very hard to find, to find a, a clear-cut definition. But anyway, here's one definition by a well-known physician in the United States, Alvin Feinstein, who originally was a mathematician and then he became a, a physician. And he wrote a fabulous book called Clinical Judgment. This was a, came out in 1967. But Feinstein wrote that clinical judgment is characterized by concrete knowledge of individual patients. It provides necessary intuitive support for deductive logic used, for example, to establish the diagnosis and pathogenesis of a patient's disease. So the one main thing of this definition is the emphasis or privilege that, that Feinstein gives to, to intuition. And this is something that I've uh, spent a bit of time thinking about, having written a book on clinical intuition. Um, but certainly intuition is important in terms of establishing the, the intersubjectivity, the intersubjective relation of a clinical encounter. And Feinstein goes on to say that, defines <coughs> his notion of clinical judgment. <coughs> Feinstein says that, his, that the physician's human sensory organs give a clinician the power to make many observations of which no inanimate instrument is capable and his human mind enables him to make constant scientific improvements in the way he performs his observations and interpretations. The clinician cannot begin to improve these functions, however, until he recognizes himself as a unique and powerful piece of scientific equipment. So this was written in 1967, something like 50 years later, right? We're now 50 years later. <laughs> um, we wonder if this, if this definition will still stand. Is the... the sensory organs of the physician, are they really what is crucial in terms of uh, human decision making? And um, one, of, one of the things that I've argued for is to think about clinical reasoning or clinical judgment as a form of, of practical wisdom or phronesis. And if, has anyone heard of the term phronesis from Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics? Aristotle says something very interesting in, in his book on, 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 on ethics. He says that there's certain kinds of wisdom, there's certain kinds of knowledge that are specific to the context. So he says if you're trying to deliberate over something practical, then you don't necessarily need the skills of a mathematician. He says, and what's important in terms of evaluating knowledge is in terms of looking at the context. And this is basically his, his definition of, of practical wisdom as a deliberation about values re the ref with reference to, to the, the ends of an action. And um, I argue that clinical reasoning is, is, is a very, very specific form of, of practical wisdom. So I'm not the only one who, who, who talks about clinical judgment or clinical reasoning as a, as a form of so, for example, Pellegrino and Tomasma, two quite well-known philosophers of medicine, uh, talk about practical wisdom as the, the, the virtue. For, so, for Aristotle, it's practical wisdom is a kind of a virtue. It's a skill that you learn through experience and through good education. You might even say through good breeding to some extent. But it, it enables us to discern which means are appropriate to the good in particular circumstances. So practical wisdom is not only trying to determine the, the right end of an action, it also relates to the means of an action, to the technical means. And if you look at this definition, you've got four different kinds of knowledge. You've got scientific knowledge, 
and you've got technical knowledge which essentially provides the means to an action and then practical wisdom which provides the, the ends of an action and there's a whole literary debate in terms of the relationship between ends and means in Aristotle but I won't really go there now but one other important aspect of practical wisdom is it has an, inter an integrative role linking the inter intellectual virtues such as science and technical knowledge with the intuitive wisdom as well as with the moral virtues as temperance and courage and so certainly uh, a good physician needs to have a good sound medical knowledge has to be able to be technically competent um, and also has to have a certain kind of intuitive understanding to know to understand his or her patient alright so this is things that I've argued in, in, my, in my book on intuition in medicine now that I've given a plug for my book I can <laughs> carry on um, so here's a question is, is, is going back to, to, to Alvin Feinstein and the, the sense of intuition as, as supporting the, the, the processes of clinical reasoning is this something that can be done better by a computer. So Hubert Dreyfus, you've probably all heard of Hubert Dreyfus. He died about two weeks ago, so he was in the news. So quite a famous philosopher in the United States, also quite controversial in the time. He was a, a professor in MIT, and then I think he got chucked out of MIT because of his, his critique of artificial intelligence. He had a big fight with uh, Seymour Papert. And then he went on to Berkeley for the rest of his career. But in around the same time that Feinstein was writing his book on, on clinical judgment, Dreyfus was writing about the limits of artificial intelligence. His first book, What Computers Can't Do, and his second book, The Power of Human Intuition and Expertise in the Era of the Computer. And what, what Dreyfus basically argue, argued was that human intelligence and expertise depend primarily on unconscious instincts rather than conscious symbolic manipulation and that these unconscious skills could never be captured in formal rules and key to this difference is the difference between knowing, th between knowing that which is basically technical expertise and knowing how knowing, knowing how to do something by which, which can often bypass um, rule based rule based procedures so at the time, um, when he published his, his, his books, Dreyfus was, was um, critiqued quite soundly by the, uh, the then developing artificial intelligence community. But in actual fact, in, with the passing of time, a number of his critiques have been shown to be correct, but has, uh, have also been taken on board by the AI community. So that today, and I'm sure there are people here in the audience who are much more familiar in terms of the deep neural computation that is able to actually um, is, is actually able to simulate the intuitive component of, of, of human intelligence. Um, Dreyfus's approach is also um, synonymous with, with his definition of, of of technical expertise and skill acquisition. So, as you can see from this pyramidal model. Um, Dreyfus and his brother Stuart Dreyfus, Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus, have written about uh, skill acquisition and it's also quite famous. Their models have been quite critiqued. It's not really important to go into you know, the, the validity of, his, of the approach now, but uh, I think it's very useful in terms of, of thinking through especially the question of medical expertise. But Dreyfus has, has this, this model where um, you start off using, the novice starts off using rule-based reasoning explicit conscious rule based reasoning and then as, a, as, it becomes more, as he or she becomes more expert switches to, to more intuitive reasoning and the model they give is the, the expert chess player um, so we're gonna look, I'm going to look a little, little bit more detail into the, the different, two different models of, of clinical reasoning one is pattern recognition which uh, more explicitly re re uh, relies on intuitive reasoning and the second is uh, hypothetical deduction which more explicitly relies on, on more explicit formal rule based reasoning I don't know if anyone saw the article that came out about two months ago about Siddhartha Mukherjee in the New Yorker 
where he talks about artificial intelligence. Anyway, I, I figured this probably most people haven't seen this, <laughs> but uh, this, this article, he quotes this article, um, where by Estevat Al, which appeared in Nature, where basically applied a deep neural network system to diagnose dermatological skin lesions. And um, what's fascinating about, about this research is it, is it seems to be pretty successful in being better than physicians, expert dermatologists, in identifying uh, malignant skin lesions. I think it's kind of initial, initial research, but um, it's definitely following this, this kind of intuitive artificial intelligence or deep, deep neural networks and showing that uh, we're beginning to, to be able to apply it to, 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 medical, to medical knowledge. But I think particularly in the medical kind of knowledge where one is uh, identifying patterns. So I would, I would argue that it's gonna, at this point it's going to still be limited in terms of its application. Uh, but anyway, the authors built a deep learning system for automated dermatology through creating a novel disease taxonomy and the disease partitioning algorithm that maps individual diseases into training classes. And as you can see, um, the neural network had a success rate of initial success rate of sev about 72%, and the expert dermatologists at around 65, 66%, which is fairly significant. Um, all right, so I mentioned that there's basically two kinds of, of, of models of, of clinical reasoning. The first, which fits into Dreyfus's model of expertise, is, sorry, is, pa is pattern recognition, for example, in, uh, in reading an x-ray or reading a dermatological slide. Um, one way of thinking about um, pattern recognition is in terms of Gestalt psychology, in, in terms of Gestalt principles which aim to formulate regularities according to which the perceptual input is organized into unitary forms. Um, and one article on, on clinical reasoning in terms of gestalt perception claims, basically argues that uh, evidence, that perception of a given object exhibits intrinsic qualities that cannot be completely reduced to its constitutive sen sensible components. Basically arguing that pattern recognition is a form of a form of gestalt perception. The other way of thinking about, oh, here's, a, here's a, uh, an image from a, also in terms of a figure ground relation. So the inhomogeneous differentiation between the, the green object and the orange or pinkish object and the, 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 the spatial background presents phenomenal, char phenomenal characteristics of the, of the green area which, um, which is important in terms of the f establishing the, the rule for Gestalt in terms of the figure ground relation. And why I wanted to mention that is because this notion of figure ground is very, very important for, for clinical reasoning and is particularly for the, the, the other way which is typically given to explain pattern recognition is in, in terms of Michael Polanyi's theory of tacit knowing. So again, I don't know if people here are familiar with Polanyi. He was a biochemist, and he worked in the uh, United States, and he had this theory of, of, of tacit knowing, where uh, most of our explicit no knowledge is built on a, on a kind of, a, kind of um, iceberg kind of background of knowledge, and, and things that, and, and there's a kind of a to and fro process between knowledge that is explicit and knowledge that is implicit. Most of our knowledge is implicit and then depending on what we focus our attention on it can become explicit. And a lot of what we consider rule-based knowledge is knowledge that has become explicit and a lot of the time we privilege that kind of knowing, explicit knowing, but actually Polanyi tries to argue that it's on the basis of a whole substrate of, of implicit knowledge which is synonymous with intuition, actually. So any kind of knowledge can be constituted as a tacit clue, including affect and emotions, provided the physician or patient relies on it indirectly when making an explicit judgment. Anyway, there's a lot more we can, you can say about this, but uh, just to move on. So Polanyi describes uh, a student reading an X-ray. At first, the student is completely puzzled, for he can see in the X-ray picture of a chest only the shadows of the heart and the ribs. <coughs> 
with a few spidery plot splotches between them. Then as he goes on listening for a few weeks, looking carefully at every new picture of every new cases, of different cases, a tentative understanding will dawn on him and eventually, if he perseveres intelligently, a rich panorama of significant will, details will be revealed to him. Sounds pretty similar to Dreyfus's definition of expertise, actually. All right, so here's also a recent study that, uh, that came out basically doing brain science of, of expert radiologists looking on the one hand at a, at a picture of a, of a mnemonic consolidation, the image on the left, and then uh, in the middle of an alligator, and, and doing brain imaging, and basically showing that when the radiologists are looking at these pictures of, uh, and, and coming to diagnoses, there's very, very similar areas, parts of the brain that are, that are lighting up as when they are looking at um, images. Um, the authors propose a generation of non-analytical diagno diagnostic hypotheses. Diagnostic hypothesis context is a result of cognitive processes subserved by brain mechanisms that are similar to those involved in naming objects or concepts in everyday life. Anyway, this is an example of the neuroscience um, grappling and get coming to terms with, uh, with what is clinical reasoning. So. Here's another study, maybe people are familiar with it, the neural basis of intuitive best next move generation, basically showing that there's a link between the, the precuneus and the caudate nucleus in terms of pattern recognition and in terms of um, an, in, an, in, an includes of, uh, of making kind of best guesses. So again, another study, but this is more interesting perhaps in, in showing the, the neural correlates of, of intuitive reasoning. Again, uh, suggesting that we, we're, getting, we're getting better to understanding and mimicking and improving on, on human cognition and, intu and, and intuitive, especially in terms of intuitive cognition. Okay, so moving on to the next model of clinical reasoning is the hypothetical deductive model. And this model is actually more predominant in terms of, in terms of the literature, although it's probably less predominant in terms of actually explaining how physicians actually think. But the, according to this theory, a clinician creates working hypotheses and then refines these hypotheses through a gradual process of elimination. Um, so it's rule-based and it's explicit and it's cognitivist. And it's, it's often um, explained or co conceptualized in terms of uh, Kahneman and Tversky's heuristics and biases approach. So so there's a lot of literature showing that uh, physicians uh, make cognitive errors, not emotional errors, but cognitive biases. The most well-known of these is, of course, the representative heuristic, where physicians make judgments based on how well the patient's presentation matches their own mental prototype for a particular decision, and it ignores decision rules and statistics such as base rates. So the, one of the examples given in the literature by Bala and Elstein, I think, is a uh, where a physician takes a lumbar puncture, gets a, a yellow consolidate, and ignores the, the kind of uh, population data or even the clinical uh, evidence and, and in terms of jumping to a conclusion that it's a hemorrhage versus a, a, men a meningitis, for example, tuberculous meningitis. Um, so, Kraskeri has proposed that in order to overcome these cognitive biases, you need a process of cognitive debiasing, where you identify what the bias is through reflection and you figure out a way of, of overcoming, over, overcoming the bias and maintaining this change in the future. And he's identified a, a number, of, I think about 40 different kinds of uh, cognitive biases that humans are prone to, but obviously computers would be less prone to if they are programmed correctly. Um, one of the important things in terms of thinking about uh, debiasing is the notion of metacognition. The activity of monitoring and controlling one's own cognitive activity and as Kroskeri defines it, the deliberate disengagement or decoupling from intuitive judgments and engagement in analytical processes to verify initial impressions. So one of the main things that's, that's striking from, from this kind of <laughs> debiasing literature is the sense that clinicians' intuitions are 
are inherently fallible if not irrational. Okay, so here you've got a tension between the, the pattern recognition approach and the Dreyfus approach, which is relying to a great extent on intuition and, and the um, decision analysis approach, which basically sees uh, human intuitions as, as uh, inherently fallible, which they are, but also inherently irrational, which I would argue they're not. Um, so there is a, a, a kind of a move to try and integrate these two forms of clinical reasoning using the dual process theory, which has been cham championed by, by Kahneman in his uh, book Thinking Fast and Slow, although I don't think he, he was the first to develop it. So the intuitive thinking would be um, conceptualized in terms of system one or type one processes, and they are fast, they're automatic and intuitive, system two, which are slow, explicit and rule-based. So the integrated model of clinical reasoning basically says we need to, these two kinds of systems or processes represent different aspects of the brain, the human brain, and we need a model that will bring them both together. So what this process argues is that certainly an expert clinician will first of all rely on, on a kind of more explicit, or sorry, more intuitive uh, hypothesis, or, or, or and, and then if, if the clinician encounters some kind of obstacle or some, some fact which contravenes against, against the hypothesis, they then go back and, and rely on the more rule-based explicit process. So, and then, and then the type 1 uh, brain processes will get overridden by type 2 process. Um, so similarly, what are the kind of source of errors in terms of this kind of... So Kroskery writes about the kinds of source of errors in terms of this kind of integrated approach. So, um, and so here's a list of some of them, but one of them is, he says, if, if the, the, the type 2 system gets so habitual that it actually becomes a kind of a type 1 process, where it becomes an automatic kind of process. Um, so for example, there's a... There's a, there's a kind of a quote that doctors use in terms of think horse beats not zebras. If you if that you think you that what's most common is going to occur most commonly and therefore um, only later if there's again it goes in along with this if 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 you you know the zebras zebras are only going to occur quite rarely. So don't think zebras first. But there are times where you might actually need to think of a of a zebra. Well from South Africa so I say I say zebra. Um, but there is a prejudice again in this kind of approach in terms of it's still thinking that even if a type 2 process is flawed, why is it flawed? It's flawed because it becomes a type 1 process. So again, it's showing this kind of bias against intuition within, within the decision analysis literature. And I argue that clinical intuition is not irrational, but actually is important in, in terms of clinical reasoning as a form of practical wisdom in terms of uniting different elements such as deductive knowledge, information from observation, past experience with groups of individuals, as well as statistical information. All right, so I just want to spend, I um, kind of don't have too much to go, but I just want to spend a little bit thinking in terms of going back to this notion of metacognition. Because I think it's really important in terms of, in terms of thinking about different uh, approaches in terms of medicine. So, Joël Proust, who's, who's, who's written most extensively on metacognition, um, defines it as a set of capacities through which an operational cognitive system is evaluated or represented by another in a context-sensitive way. And she also says that this competence for self-evaluation is based in part on non-analytical knowledge, and it includes noetic feelings, which she hints might be related to type 1 processes. Um, she also says that it's a form of self-evaluation containing functional features independent of those associated with the self-attribution of mental states. So Proust is basically attacking a kind of representational notion of metacognition in terms of explicit knowing. Um, so I hope you're kind of keeping up with this more like philosophical kind of, of thinking. Um, but what's important here is that in her notion of metacognition, she's basically arguing for, for, the, for, the, for the validity of a non-representational 
non-conceptual, intuitive, or what she calls noetic um, aspect of, of cognition. And she says the reflexive structure of command and monitoring and the intervention of epistic feelings allow an agent to conduct mental actions on the basis of non-conceptual contents. So again, what's very relevant for me is that this notion of metacognition gives rational validity to aspects of cognition which are not amenable to explicit <coughs> rules but also and representation, but also means it's much more difficult to to, re to, to analyze in terms of a re reductionistic approach. So metacognition is important in terms of my own work, in terms of at the Mifne Center, in terms of working with families and infants with autism. <coughs> and one of the key aspects is a feedback process where you, you show videos and you discuss with the parents how they interact with their children, the infants. And it allows the, the parents to, to, f to have feedback and to through cognitive reflection and metacognition to, to in have some kind of therapeutic change. So people have written about this, for example, Fonagy has written that reflective function, which essentially is the same as metacognition, in my understanding, <coughs> he defines it in terms of mental state constructs. Oh, so what I wanted to say was that this aspect of metacognition ca is not, can not only be self-directed, but can be self-other directed as well, for example, in these feedback processes. So it refers to the reflective function, refers to the ability for caregivers to understand ch a child's intentional stance, and it underlies the capacities for affect regulation, impulse control, etc. Can, can you give an explicit example? In terms of reflective function or the... Or the um, well, what happens in the feedback process is that, I mean, at Mifne you have a playroom, where the, the parent goes into the playroom and plays with the child, it's videoed, and then, and then the, um, come out of the session and the therapist shows the, the parent how they were with the child and says, oh, look at this instance, you did this and this and this, how do you feel about it, what do you think about this, would you think of doing, doing this action differently, for example. <coughs> so it's providing a kind of a, a cognitive feedback process and, and so perhaps what's different from the debiasing of Kroskeri is he's specifically referring to cognitive kind of errors, where this is referring also to affect, but it could also be cognitive as well. And why is it special to autism? It's not special to autism, but it's it's just very key to the work there, which is where I'm based. So it could be other forms of therapy or but it's special to autism because uh, because the children with autism, I mean, depending what theory you're having, but there's a, there's a certain lack of sense of self, there's a certain uh, problem of social interaction, so the parents have to be the container for the child to provide the, the ability for the child to self-regulate in terms of affect and even in terms of cognitive development. I mean, we're dealing with infants from six months, um, but so it, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's special to autism, but it is unique in, in terms of the context, in terms of the early development and in terms of the, the problems in the development of the sense of self. And you need, you, for, for metacognition, you need a sense of self to, to reflect on one's own, one's own uh, um, decision-making processes. And, and um, I'm not talking about empathy here, I haven't got time, but, but empathy is a kind of a key, a key part of it. Um, so there's a whole world here, I think. I don't know if I've answered your question <laughs> adequately, but uh, maybe we can talk a bit more at the end, if you want. So just moving back in terms of neuroscience, so something that I've, you know, I met, um, this is from the, the lab of Michael Shadlin in Columbia University, where I was privileged to meet uh, at a conference a number of months ago, the Panlia Institute, <coughs> but he writes about, uh, well, in terms of his research on signal detection theory and um, training monkeys to, to make decisions with an eye movement and then, and then therefore to work back um, from the motor cortex. So I'm just trying to find... Uh -oh. I can't... Uh, anyway, I have some notes here, but I can't get to them. <laughs> um, 
so I can't read. But anyway, he, he has this notion of um, freedom from immediacy. That basically, in terms of that, you can't really predict with where the, the monkey, the decision the monkey is going to make. And I would say the monkey can't even predict the decision that, that he's going to make. But um, through, uh, at some point, a threshold of decision making is reached, and then the monkey makes a decision. But through the complexity of, of the neural networks, there's what he calls a kind of a freedom of immediacy, where you're not, you're not and he wrote, he's written an interesting article with a neuroethicist, Dina Rask, he's looking at the, the question of free will. You know, can brain science help us to know whether humans are determinist, whether it is a neural determinism or whether we have free will? But he, 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 I think he wants to suggest that through this notion of freedom of immediacy, through his research on, on, on looking at single neurons, that we have the, the capacity for freedom of choice, but this capacity is premised on um, it's, it's premised on implicit knowledge. So basically knowledge that is hidden to is unconscious. And I, I can't really get to this, but I've got it written down in some notes. I just want to read, uh, just want to read what he said, actually. Um, but this is really, I think, crucial in terms of thinking about metacognition, in terms of Prout's model of, of metacognition having a very fundamental noetic or, or non-conceptual element to it. So, um, so, so Shadon writes, there's a freedom of flexibility inherent to the neural architecture of decision making that links with sensory information, motor activity and probabilistic reasoning that while dependent on the determinism of neural activity also enables a certain freedom from immediacy. And then he writes in another in another. Uh, place an emerging consensus in both neurology and neuroscience is that much cognition occurs without the aid of consciousness. There are fascinating questions that arise about how unconscious and conscious processes interact. I have written that the neurobiology of conscious and non-conscious cognitive functions probably utilize similar mechanisms. Both involve decisions and in particular decisions to engage in certain ways. When those ways involve the possibility of navigating planning to possibly reach, look, grasp, and the like, they're implicated in spatial awareness. When the ways involve the possibility of pointing out, planning to possibly report, make narrative, or recall later for purposes of communication, even with the self, then they support much of what we think of as consciousness. So now we kind of back to <laughs> the beginning of this talk in terms of relating kind of neuroscience and, and consciousness, and also back to the question of practical judgment. So, uh, one f important philosopher, for example, for example, Anscom, a British philosopher, has written that practical judgment is motivated by an intention that is non-observable. So the actor is not actually able to observe the intention of the practical action. And another, uh, I, another uh, element of practical judgment or practical wisdom is that the end of an action is the action itself rather than a result external to the action. So practical judgment cannot be reduced to some kind form of technical expertise. It cannot be reduced to some kind of know that, but is always ultimately a form of know how in terms of the Dreyfus model. And um, so the challenge really is, 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 to, is to see how far neuroscience can take us in, st in terms of and understanding and analyzing the components of human decision making of which clinical uh, decision making or clinical judgment is a, is a particular kind, and um, also knowing what are perhaps what are the limits in terms of this unconscious element, which is vital for freedom of immedi immediacy, for uh, free will. And again, I think this trying to pass this requires a fruitful engagement and collaboration between neuroscientists and philosophers and other other engaged, uh, engaged people. So my take home points would be for to, to, to claim that there's a need for a new field to emerge, which at this point I call clinical neuroscience. It will include the neuroscience of moral decision making in medicine, and it will account or give place for intuition and practical wisdom, and it will be both top down and bottom up. So, you know, again, referring to the kind of the medical things on the board outside, um, 
medicine, neuroscience is very important in terms of, for, for med or medicine is very important for neuroscience in terms of its relevance. Okay, now we've got a cure for Huntington's disease. But also in terms of disease performing, pre 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 presenting a kind of a, a human or a natural scientific laboratory in which we can understand the brain. And, and this typically has been in terms of the work of Lurie and other people where you look at the, the kind of the deficits in terms of human function as a way of understanding normal, normal human function. But it's also necessary in terms of, in, in terms of a dialogue happening both top down and bottom up. So it's not simply in terms of, you know, it's, it's again going back to the, what I saw outside in terms of the artifice, in terms of understanding primitive, primitive reasoning, it's really, really crucial. We also need to figure out a way of looking at human decision making and having a, a fruitful dialogue between the bottom up and the top down processes. And collaboration is, 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 is completely necessary for this. And uh, I, so I would welcome anyone who'd be interested in trying to look at ways of developing uh, collaborative opportunities in terms of developing a field of neuroethics in Israel, subsection which would be looking at uh, medicine and, and neuroscience. So uh, thank you very much. And look forward to coming to the So, you know, my, my argument is in terms of the importance of, of, of practical wisdom, and I only looked at one aspect in terms of cognition, and then you've got at least two other aspects in terms of action and intentionality and empathy, and I think there's, there'll always be room for the human element, and, and my argument, and going back to the Dreyfus critique, is that, that human intelligence ultimately can, can not be replaced by computers. That doesn't mean that computers won't replace much of it, but I, I would say particularly in the medical realm, you're still going to have a role for doctors, but obviously that role is going to change significantly with, with, increased, with increased understanding. So, um, but it's open, you know, so uh, let's see what, <laughs> what happens. But I think there's so much emphasis on let's find this kind of reductionistic kind of uh, magic bullet or something like that, which will cure us of the human condition. You know, and I don't think we're ever going to be cured of the human condition, and, and, and I think we, and if we are, probably uh, God save us at that moment, you know. We, we, so, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'd rather at this point just leave it completely open and, and, and think of, bring people around the table to try and, 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 and reflect <coughs> rather, than <laughs> rather than give any, any, uh, any magic answers myself. You know, and one of the things that, you know, I, I, was, I was, was a postdoc at McGill doing neuroethics and I used to go to the, uh, uh, to the hospital there and listen to neuro, a lot of neuroscience lectures and it always struck me that you'd find some brilliant neuroscientist who would get up there and give an amazing talk about this very, 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 very minute part of the brain which does this and this and this and you know exactly this and this and this and this and look, I didn't understand much of it because I'm not a neuroscientist but I just got a sense do we really know what's going on, you know? And, and I think what's really important is to have a, you know, this is, <laughs> that's my talk is unusual where I'm coming and saying, actually, I don't really have the answers. You know, let's, let's, let's think more. And, but in terms of science and, you know, in terms of grants and in terms of prestige, you want to come up and say, okay, I'm identifying this and it works like this and, and this, is what it's got, this is what it's doing. And, and so I'm, I'm actually, w fairly comfortable in being, a, in being in a zone of, of, of <laughs> non-knowledge and, and, and trying to figure out uh, in, a more, in a more total sense. But again, this relation between top-down, bottom-up, between consciousness and, and brain function and, and you know, having a conversation going. I'm not sure this is relevant, but you are related to well, I work there, yes. So you work there. So in what sense is, is it um, a unique approach to treating autism and does it integrate any of these, of these ideas? Well, it certainly integrates the, 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 the feedback.
Mismed unique in a number of ways. One is that it's, it's been around, it's celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So Khan Alonin, the director, has been uh, pioneering early intervention for 30 years, probably about 25 years before anyone else was, was talking about it. And that sense, the, the other way it's unique is in terms of the predominant approach to treating autism is, is ABA. And the approach at Mifne is more based on attachment and fostering communication. It's also unique in terms of, in terms of, of the age of treatment, so it has a... So ABA is part of the treatment? Not at all, no, no. not at all. It's kind of a counseling in a sense, ABA. And it's more based on, and also in terms of the age of intervention, so from six months. So now you have a lot of research uh, talking about early diagnosis, but as yet there's, n there's very limited actual early intervention programs internationally, so people come actually from all over the world for treatment. The other thing that's unique about it is it's not simply treating the child, it's treating the whole family. So it combines a sy family systems therapy together with a uh, form of play therapy for the infant. So that's also unique. And also in terms of its intensity, it's a, it's a three-week residential program, 21 days, of 21 days, <laughs> including Shabbat, and uh, that's, that's unique. So um, I'm sure there's other aspects of it, but it's a pretty, pretty six unique program. Three weeks. Oh, six months. Children six months. diagnosed with six months. Pre-autism mm -hmm. pre or program of autism. <coughs> How do you do? Well, you, there's a constellation. So, you know, today you've got a, a bunch of, of early intervention uh, intervention tools. Um, Ms. Nez developed their own one called Espazi, which has eight um, diagnostic features, including lack of eye contact, uh, excess of motor activity, um, pa passivity in terms of motor activity, problems with eating. Um, excessive head circumference and forget the others. But, uh, the it, but basically it's a constellation. And um, again, you can really only formally diagnose autism from around 18 months in terms of the ADOS. Um, but by that time that you've diagnosed it, it's actually very late in terms of intervention. So you've got a catch-22 in terms of... Uh, <laughs> so you know, the, one of the criticisms perhaps against the approach is, well, how do you know you're treating autism? Well, you, you don't, but you do know that, you, that there's a significant improvement in the behaviors of the, of the infant before and after, and um, the label is perhaps a little bit less, less important, but, um, but you're not, you, you know, if a child really has autism, um, that child is not going to be cured in three weeks. You're going to, you're going to give the fundamentals for the, for the family to, to change the trajectory of, of that child's development. And about 85% of the children go to mainstream schools, uh, follow up. So, um, but it's very fascinating to see the changes day by day with the infants. I was thinking I should have come and given a talk about, about autism, but I thought, uh, I thought, um, <laughs> well, I only had a week to prepare and I wanted to give, present about neuroethics, but if you're interested in a talk about early intervention with autism, I'd be happy to come back either by myself or, or with Khana Olonim or she could come. So, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's quite fascinating and to see the videos of, you know, all the, all the treatments are, are filmed. Um, and